Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and let's check out how I remade three interesting mechanics and systems from Cyberpunk 2077. The three mechanics I will be covering here are the diegetic world UI, where the player interacts directly with the world rather than through a separate UI, the scanning vision, where you can enter a mode and identify special objects and get data from them, and the hacking minigame, which has some very interesting rules. I will cover how they work, how I remade them, and how you too can make these systems in your own games. Now, this is the first video of this type, where I am remaking mechanics from popular games, so let me know in the comments if you find this type of video useful. My goal is to show you how all of these AAA games look impossibly complex at the surface, but if you dig around a bit, you will find that most of the systems they use are actually pretty simple, and you can make them yourself as well. So, first up, the Diegetic World UI. This is a really awesome system that surprisingly few games actually use. So here I am inside of Cyberpunk, and there's this vending machine. I can look at each individual button on the vending machine and press a button to make a purchase. When I do, I spend some money and an item is spawned. So in a lot of games, this simple interaction would pop up as a separate UI, but I really prefer this in-world system. Just use the mouse to point towards the button inside the world and take an action. Another one is over here on the elevator. Again, two buttons and I can directly look at what I want to press and take an action. So that's how it works in Cyberpunk. There's no UI that pops up. All of the buttons exist in the world, which helps keep you immersed in the game. And over here is my version. So I'm on this really nice sci-fi city. This is actually an asset pack that you can grab for yourself. So over here, I've got this really nice vending machine. And over here, I see three interactable buttons. So I can simply look at them, press a button on the keyboard, and there you go, a soda comes out. So select that one and spawns that object, that one spawns that object, and that one spawns that object. So just like that. So you can see how this is much more immersive than having a separate UI when approaching this to take this action. Then on the other side, over here, I've got another one. I've got a really nice ATM machine. Once again, it has all of these individual buttons. So I can interact and I can see the buttons being pressed and interacted over there on the screen. So as you can see, this system is much more immersive than having a separate UI to interact with all of these objects in the world. So let's see how all of this works. The core of it is essentially based on a world canvas, which I covered in detail in a separate video. Essentially, that's how you can place UI elements in your world. So over here, I've got my vending machine object, and then in front of it, I've got this really nice vending machine canvas. And in there, the buttons are just really normal images. So these are standard UI elements. They just have an image and then a script to capture some clicks on the world. So on the canvas itself, I've got another script for my Raycast UI. Let's look at this. And here it is. It's a very simple script. And what it does is essentially just this. We do a Raycast on the input mouse position. So the mouse is always down the center. Then checks if it has some results. So if there's any object underneath the mouse. And then it simply identifies the object by trying to get this interface. And then down here, simply have a basic keyboard input. And if so, then look into the last selected object and trigger the other function. So here is the script that handles the logic for the vending machine. So just a bunch of references for the prefabs to spawn, where to spawn it, and all of the various buttons. Then here I'm listening to the button events in order to change the color on mouse over. Then on pointer down, we spawn a specific can for each of them. Then over here for the ATM, it's exactly the same thing. So all of the individual buttons inside of a canvas. And then a second canvas that just has a text object. And then here, just some extremely basic logic. So the whole thing is just based on using a canvas in the world and doing a raycast. And again, here it is in the game. So I just approach the vending machine. I look directly at which button I want. I press the button and there you go. I'm ordering some soda, some things. There you go. All of them popping out. And over here on the ATM, I input my code and just like that. So as you can see, this is a great system and it's really pretty easy to implement. So when you work on your own games, before you decide to make a separate UI, take some time to decide if that action wouldn't be better to be made directly inside of the world. Next up, we've got the scanning vision. So this is a really awesome one that took me quite a lot of effort to get just right. So here in the game, I can press the tab key in order to enable the scanner. So the first thing it does is it completely changes the visual for the whole game. The objects that are scannable are highlighted and if I look at them, I can scan them and get some extra information. So it says this type of object and a bunch more data. So the main part for this system is the visual. It completely changes how everything is rendered with different colors and extra post-processing effects. And then it also changes the scannable objects and applies an outline to them. So it's a really interesting visual that makes it very clear when you are in scanning mode and when you're in normal mode. Now, remaking this mechanic was really tough. Shaders and rendering is the main game dev topic that I'm least familiar with since usually I work in 2D, but after a lot of trial and error, here is my version. So it starts off with the level looking quite normal. 
So again, it's that awesome sci-fi pack. So if you want to look at this to make your own version of Cyberpunk, check the link in the description. So I can walk around, everything looks perfectly normal. Then as I press my tab key, yep, there you go. Our scanning vision is now enabled and I can see how some objects now have a nice outline and they don't look clearly different from everything else. And then if I take my mouse and I point it towards an object, there you go, I get some extra information from that object. So visually, this is a bit different from the scanning vision in the game itself, but I think it works quite well. So all the objects are clearly highlighted. So as I go back into normal, everything looks like that. And I go into scanning. Yep, I can indeed see automatically that all of these are scannable. Like I said, remaking this was really tricky, mainly because shaders and rendering are not my main skill sets. So how I ended up achieving this is possibly not the best way. So someone could probably make this with some handwritten shaders in a better way, but still, I'm very happy with what I've accomplished there. The whole thing is based on two very simple shaders and playing around with render features. And by the way, if you find the video helpful, consider subscribing and hitting the like button. It really helps out the channel. So over here, I've got my render pipeline asset. I'm using the universal render pipeline. And over here, you can see it uses a whole bunch of different renderers. So first off, here's everything looking perfectly normal. Then when I engage scanning vision, the first thing that it does is it enables this post-processing object. So as I enable, Yep, there you go, everything changes the visual. So it applies some color adjustment, essentially turns everything into a green tint, applies a nice little film grain and so on. However, just with this, we don't see these cannonball objects being highlighted at all. So then on top of that, I go into the main player camera and in here change the renderer for a different one. And that adds a glow outline to all of the cannonball objects. Now how the objects are identified are by the layer. So if I select this car in here, I can see over here on the layer, they are on the scanning layer. So I can inspect the individual render right in here. And as you can see, it has an extra render features. And this one on the layer mask, it applies to the scanning and scanning selected. And what it does essentially just overrides the material. It uses up this material, which simply has a custom shader. And here it is in shader graph, and it's a very simple shader. All it really does is just moves the vertices along with some noise. So the object has this nice movement and then simply applies a flat color onto it. So with that effect, we end up with these objects that have an outline, but they still don't look too different from everything else. So on top of that, then I have another camera here that automatically gets enabled. And in there on the preview, you can see what the camera sees. So this one is only rendering objects on the scanning layer. And here it is what this does in game as I disable and enable the camera. Yep, there you go. You can see that the object gets rendered on top as a pure black object. So this one is using this renderer, which is overriding a different material. And the material is using just a normal shader. So here it is, extremely simple. It's literally just the master node, just tinted completely in black with 80% alpha. So essentially that one combined with the previous outline really makes each scannable object really stand out. And lastly, there's another camera with another render. And as I enable this one, right now you don't actually see any difference. That's because this one only applies to the scanning selected layer. So in the scene view, if I see the camera preview, it doesn't see anything. But if I go onto this car and I manually change it from scanning into the scanning selected, and if there you go, that's what it does. So that camera is using another render. Here it is. And again, this one is only being applied to the scanning selected. And this one is on the event after rendering. So it renders that object after the whole post-processing goes through and it adds an extra outline. And then on top of it, the normal object. So that's how all the visuals are set up and all the logic is handled through this simple script. So it's very tiny, pretty much under a hundred lines long. We just have references to all of the cameras and everything. And over here, the function to enable or disable the scanning mode just does everything that we saw. So it enables the various cameras, enables the post-processing and modifies the main camera renderer. And then here on the update, if it is active, then we are simply doing a recast on the mouse position. So right down the center. And then we check if the object is a scannable object. And if so, then we fire an event when the active scanned object changes. And then there's a simple UI script that listens to that event. So here it is listening to that event. And when that happens, it simply updates the UI to show that object. So here is the UI and each object simply has a script with just a bunch of data. So again, here it is in game. So everything starts off looking completely normal. Then I press tab and there you go. We go into scanning vision and look at that. That one is highlighted. So it has a name, affiliation and so on. As I look at something, it changes the visual and it shows me some nice stats. So there you go. I can look at all of them. So again, this was really tricky to get everything working, but I'm quite pleased with the end result. It requires some trickery with the renderer features and multiple cameras, but I think it looks quite great. So here it is another awesome mechanic and how you can implement it in your own games. And the last system that I remade was the hacking minigame. So here it is in Cyberpunk. When you scan something or you want to crack some encryption, you go into this nice minigame. The important part is up here. This is the sequence that we must find. 
Then we also have a buffer. So this is essentially how many attempts we have. If we fill the buffer without achieving the sequence, then we'll lose the minigame. There is also a timer that starts counting down as soon as I select the first code. And over here is the board filled with a bunch of hex codes. The rules are that you start off on the topmost horizontal line. So you can choose any of these values, but none of the ones down here. Then when you do choose, now it goes into vertical mode. So now you can only select the values from this vertical line, and it always swaps between horizontal and vertical. And the goal is to hit the sequence. So in this case, just select this code, and yep, there's the win. So that's the minigame. It's pretty simple, but it's just the right level of complexity for a nice bonus minigame. And over here is my version. So it looks pretty much exactly the same, since it's really just a UI element, and I grab the exact texture. Functionally, it is pretty much a perfect recreation. So over here, I've got a randomly generated correct sequence, the total buffer size, the timer, the timer bar, and over here, the entire grid. And again, all the rules are correct, so right now I must select from up here, so if I click anything down here, then nope, nothing works. And by the way, I also got a simple cursor just following around, so that's nice. And now, it's as soon as I pick one, so let's see one that follows the correct path. So right in here, if I select this one, there you go, it gets added in there, and the timer starts counting down. So next up, I gotta go into BD, so now I gotta select from vertical, so I can't click any of these, gotta go down here, and now another 1C, so go in there, and there you go, we've got a win. So here it is, and this one was relatively simple to remake, there's really nothing too special here, it's just a nice and simple minigame. So here is the whole script, and it's really just 400 lines long. When you start the minigame, it simply generates a bunch of random possible values, then generates a correct sequence, and it initializes the whole thing, so it defines a size for the buffer, sets up a timer, then we go through the whole grid and generate some random values for it. Now this whole script is included in the downloadable project files if you want to check it out. Now the trickiest part for this one was how do you guarantee that the correct sequence is possible? Since the rules for this game are pretty strict, essentially you have to go horizontal, then vertical, and so on, so if you use just pure randomness, you will probably end up with an incorrect sequence that cannot be possible. So my solution here was really just the most straightforward thing possible. I just have this function which forces a solution. So it starts off on horizontal, so it starts off by picking a random one from the first horizontal row. Then it picks a random one from the following vertical line and forces it to the second sequence code. And just keeps going until it finds the whole sequence. So it's a very straightforward approach and works pretty great. So the game starts off like this, I have to get the sequence, so as I look around the board, yep, I can see this one, this one, and this one, and there you go, we've got a win. So here it is, the nice minigame fully working. Alright, so there you have it. Three very interesting systems and mechanics from Cyberpunk 2077, and how you too can build them in your own games. First up, how to handle UI interactions in your world. Then, how to make a visually interesting scanning mode. And lastly, a nice simple hacking minigame. Like I said, this is the first video of this type, so if you like this kind of content, hit the like button and let me know in the comments. I think this could be a very useful ongoing series for analyzing and remaking popular games. This video is made possible thanks to these awesome supporters. Go to patreon.com slash unitycodemonkey to get some perks and help keep the videos free for everyone. Alright, so thanks for watching, post any questions you have in the comments, and I'll see you next time.